Welcome everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to today's Meet the DM Drug Developer session. We are here today, August 5th, to talk with the PepGen team. A little bit about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We envision a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy. Our mission is community care and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care. We accelerate research, research towards treatment and a cure. Just a reminder of some of the resources and support available from MDF. We have toolkits and, and publications, including our clinical care guidelines on our website at myotonic.org slash toolkits dash publications. Many of our support programs, including information about our support groups specifically, can be found on our website at myotonic.org slash find dash support. Our calendar of events, which includes all of the activities, are at myotonic.org slash calendar slash month. And our digital academy, which is home to all of our presentations, including at a later date, this current presentation. Um, any of the recordings that we may have from past conferences or events, they will be housed on our digital academy. And you can find those at myotonic.org slash digital dash academy. And probably next week, we will see today's current presentation uh, posted to our digital academy. We have had quite a few Meet the Drug Developer sessions this year. They were held on the first Friday of the month at 12 o'clock, just like today. Um, please feel comfortable going back to review any of those you might not have seen. You can find all of those past sessions at myotonic.org slash meet dash DM dash drug dash developers. We also have a lot of recorded Ask the Expert sessions that were held earlier this year on the third Friday of the month at 12 o'clock. And we have one more left this month on the 19th, looking at disability rights, future planning, and special needs. You can find all of those sessions at myotonic.org slash ask dash expert dash series. Okay, let's meet the Peptin team. Elena Tress is the Associate Director of Patient Advocacy. She has over 10 years of biotech experience between patient advocacy and medical affairs in smaller sized companies like Pepgen and bigger companies alike. She studied economics at St. Louis University and received her Master of Public Health degree at Boston University to fuel her curiosity of how individuals, communities, and physicians make healthcare decisions. She joined Pepgen earlier this year and is excited to bring her prior, prior rare neuromuscular disease experience to this community. Today, we also have with us Holly Hand, who is the clinical operations consultant for PEPGEN. She's been in the clinical trial industry for approximately 15 years, primarily in the CNS space, and joined the PEPGEN team this year as clinical operations consultant. She will be leading the clinical team in the DM1 program. She lives on a ranch with her husband, her three tiny humans, and more animals than she can count. We also have Dr. Jane Larkindale, Vice President of Clinical Science. Jane dedicated the last 15 years of her career to accelerating therapy development for neuromuscular diseases through supporting research, developing collaborations, developing data sharing platforms, and seeking regulatory acceptance of disease models, outcome assessments, and biomarkers. She has worked with world leaders in the rare disease space, including the MDA, Frederick's Ataxia Research Alliance, the Critical Path Institute, and the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We also have today Jaya Goya, the Vice President of Research and Preclinical Development. She holds nearly 30 years of experience in biotech research and development, including extensive experience in rare disease research. Previously, she served as Senior Vice President, Preclinical and Clinical Development Sciences at Wave Life Sciences, 
where she led preclinical pharmacology, toxicology, bioanalytical, DMPK, clinical pharmacology, and biomarker functions to support the preclinical and clinical development of nucleic acid-based therapeutics for fatal neurological diseases, including moving multiple candidates successfully from preclinical to clinical development. Previously, she worked at Biogen in roles of increasing responsibility, including senior director, value-based medicine, where she directed patient satisfaction and personalized medicine approaches for people with multiple sclerosis. She trained as a postdoctoral fellow at New England Medical Center and Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center after completing her PhD in biochemistry at Central Drug Research Institute in India. We also have with us Michelle Millian, Senior Vice President, Head of Clinical Development. She has extensive experience in evaluation and treatment of neuromuscular and neurological indications, having worked in both academic and commercial settings. Most recently, she served in roles of increasing responsibility, including Executive Medical Director at Fulcrum Therapeutics, where she led the design and implementation of phase one, two, and three clinical trials for the company's novel treatment of FSHD. While leading clinical development efforts at Fulcrum, she also worked as an attending physician affiliated at Tufts Medical Center, specializing in neurology as a member of their pediatrics department. Michelle has also led leadership roles at Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Biogen, where she facilitated the preclinical translation and clinical development of treatments for pain, multiple sclerosis, and other indications. Prior to joining Biogen, Michelle was an attending neurologist at the MDA clinic and attending physician and assistant professor of neurology at Alpert Medical School, Brown University. Michelle completed her residency at Brown Medical School, received her medical doctorate from Wake Forest University School of Medicine, and earned her BA in molecular biology from Colgate University. Many of you have submitted questions in advance, to which we thank you. The presenters are doing their best to try to answer those questions during the presentation today. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel comfortable submitting them. You can just open the questions tab, type your question and click send. Those questions will get directly to our presenters today. If you have a smartphone, you won't quite see it the same way, and you'll have to go to the question mark icon at the top of the screen, then you can type your question and click send. If today's program speaks to you, please consider showing your appreciation with a donation to MDF. You can find our donate page at myotonic.org slash donate. Okay, it is time to meet the PepGen team. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you to the FMDF Foundation for hosting us today. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, so thank you again for the introduction, Tanya. My name is Elena Tress, and I'll be starting us off today. Welcome to Meet the DM Drug Developers. We're PepGen. We're so excited to be here. The focus of the presentation today will be on our program, PGN EDODM1. For the agenda today, we're going to start off with a background and overview of PepGen as a company. And then we really like the spirit and the, the theme of meet, drug, meet the Drug Developers. So we'll start off with a summary of the functions that are contributing to drug development. Followed by that, we'll move to enhanced delivery oligonucleotides in DM1. Then our preclinical data of EDODM1 or our animal data that we have so far then followed by the clinical development plan that we have for EDODM1, and then the Q&A session. And thank you to all of you so far who've submitted your questions. The ones we got in advance, we'll start out with at the beginning of the Q&A and then open it up to see what else we get from, a li from live Q&A. So I'll hand it over to Michelle. 
So thank you everybody for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk with you uh, today. It is, it is an honor to have this opportunity and thank you, uh, Tanya and the MDF. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk with you about PepGen. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the prior slide uh, prior to this were our disclaimers, which I'm sure some of you have seen uh, in other uh, presentations. Uh, and um, I'm not going to read this uh, to you, but uh, you've seen it previously. Next slide, please. These are my disclosures. And if you go to the next slide, please. So my name is Michelle Mellian. I'm the SVP and Head of Clinical Development uh, here at PepGen. Um, I am a neurologist. I do have subspecialty training in neuromuscular disease. I've been in the clinic uh, for nearly 20 years. The first half of my career was mainly spent in academia uh, where I uh, did um, my own research uh, as well as um, attended in um, the uh, MDA clinic, as well as my own uh, personal clinic. And um, when I was in um, medical school, I decided to dedicate my life uh, to uh, neuromuscular disease, as well as treating uh, people living with neuromuscular diseases and to help find uh, meaningful therapies uh, for neuromuscular diseases. And as part of my experience, I have been very involved uh, in uh, supporting uh, people living uh, with myotonic dystrophy as well as their uh, families. And um, I joined uh, PepGen earlier this year uh, with uh, the intent of continuing uh, to contribute to the development of meaningful therapies that I can provide to patients and families in the clinic. So for those of you that are not aware, uh, PepGen is a clinical stage biotechnology company. We are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but we also have lab space uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. And we're very excited uh, because we will be moving uh, into a combined lab and office space building uh, in late uh, 2022 in Boston. And that's the picture in uh, the lower left uh, there that you can see. Um, currently, our programs are mainly focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, as well as myotonic dystrophy. And in our company, we currently have 30 plus employees, and we're continuing to expand to support uh, these programs, including our program in myotonic dystrophy. And our plat and you can see our um, our company, a picture uh, here in uh, the upper left uh, is most of us attending uh, a picnic, uh, as well as uh, some of our colleagues uh, in um, the, I believe that's the seaport in front of the Boston uh, skyline. And in the lower right-hand corner, you can see Jane, who will be talking to you later, as well as um, a key uh, person in our company, who's Amiko, who um, really does a lot of coordination. She's the director of operations uh, in our current office space. And so the, the basis of our technology is enhanced delivery oligonucleotides. And um, we know that oligonucleotides can be very effective in targeting the underlying cause of disease. However, the challenge uh, for oligonucleotides is that they can't get to the tissues of interest. And so what PepGen has done based on uh, uh, research um, from, um, from Oxford as well as from Cambridge is to develop this platform of enhanced delivery oligonucleotides, which are well-characterized therapeutic PMO oligonucleotides that are conjugated to our proprietary enhanced delivering peptides. And some of you may be asking yourself, what is a peptide? And a peptide essentially uh, is a chain of amino acids uh, that are usually, uh, in this case, are positively charged. And what we do is, is that you can see a schematic here uh, on the left of the amino acids uh, strung together. Uh, in the dark blue is um, our positively charged uh, amino acids that are separated in the light blue by what's called a hydrophobic core. 
And the idea is, is that these are engineered with the goal of offering improved tolerability and activity in those tissues of interest. And so in uh, myotonic dystrophy, those tissues of interest, of course, are skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, as well as uh, the CNS. And what we have done is we've taken this peptide, these amino acids, and that we've um, basically conjugated it to a therapeutic oligonucleotides. And oligonucleotides are those genetic medicines that target the root cause of disease. Um, and we, with, by uh, conjugating the uh, peptide to the oligonucleotide. We have our enhanced delivery oligonucleotides, which has resulted in efficient cellular uptake of the therapeutic oligonucleotides, including in cardiac, skeletal tissue, as well as the CNS. And we'll show you that data uh, in just a moment. And what we're showing here is our, pep, our, is our pipeline, and our pipeline is really committed to developing meaningful therapies uh, for patients living with rare diseases. You can see here that our lead program is in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. However, we are learning a lot from our Duchenne program that will also inform our closely following program in myotonic dystrophy uh, type 1. In addition, we do uh, we will be looking at other uh, exon skippers uh, for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we do have other um, uh, other uh, therapies in the pipeline that are also in discovery as well for other neurologic and neuromuscular indications. So now I'm going to turn it over to Elena, who will uh, review the, uh, the summary of functions that contribute to uh, drug development. Thanks, Michelle. So for the next portion of this presentation and in the theme of today of meeting the drug developers, we wanted to highlight to you some of the key functions you'll be meeting today at PepGen that contribute to drug development. Starting at the top, we have clinical development, and then going counterclockwise, preclinical development and research, clinical operations, and advocacy. And as those four functions internally at PepGen contribute to drug development, we do have the DM1 community in the center as also contributing to drug, drug development as we learn so much from the community on what a meaningful medicine might be and how we can use that information amongst these four different functions to do so. Sorry, right, just advancing to the next slide. So I'll start us off by sharing a little bit about my function of patient advocacy. A little bit about me. So as Tanya said in the beginning, my background is in economics and public health. Those were two areas to study where I really learned about how people use data to make decision and how data can influence decision making. And I love applying that to my daily work and how patients, families, and physicians make healthcare decisions. I'm a big believer that an educated patient is an empowered patient. So I also spend a lot of my time with my colleagues focusing on ways that we can learn about what the educational needs are of the DM1 community and how we can expand upon that, whether it's around DM1, PEPGENS therapies, and also clinical trial awareness. I have 10 years in the biotechnology industry between medical affairs and advocacy, including previous experience in neuromuscular rare disease. Um, I worked in the Pompeii community for a few years, which really taught me a lot and I think cre created a, a nice foundation for me now learning about the DM community. And I always say my best days are at work are ones like today where I get to have direct interactions with the community and the families. It's where I learn the most. It's when I'm the most inspired. For this slide, I want to show with inpatient advocacy how we empower the DM1 community inside and outside of PEPGEN. On the left-hand side of the slide, some ways that advocacy helps to empower the DM1 community is to make sure that you have timely and transparent updates of PEPGEN CM1 program, making sure that we offer educational materials and venues for the community to ask us questions and be able to learn more about our technology, 
support general DM1 community events and initiatives that you have going on, help you raise awareness about DM and the unmet needs of the community, and creating space for to make sure that the DM1 community is heard by PepGen, which leads me to the other side of this slide, which is my something I take to heart, which is how can I and how can my function best represent the DM1 community internally at PepGen? So some ways we do that is to make sure that I share community insights at pivotal decision-making points in the within our program team, which we'll talk about later today. Inviting my cross-functional team members to community events and ad boards so they can have the same privilege that I do to hear from the community firsthand. Creating opportunities for my fellow employees to learn about the community perspective of people living with DM1. We always get constant feedback that employees love learning about DM1 in the community and it, it really inspires them as well. And making sure that we're establishing trust in the community trust between PepGen and the community to make sure that we can have an open forum to learn more about the community, ask questions both ways and get feedback both ways, and making sure that PepGen has resources secured to support different opportunities that arise within the DM1 community. I wanted to show in this slide how the role that the DM1 community and the insight they provide where that falls in the drug development timeline. So this is a very simplified version of the drug development timeline that's typically a very long and complicated process. But starting on the left-hand side, starting with preclinical studies. So as a reminder, these are studies to test the proof of concept and establish tolerability and efficacy in animals. And even in this stage, it's important for us to learn from the DM1 community and hear from the community when PepGen and the researchers at PepGen are analyzing preclinical data to see if a proposed therapy may meet the unmet needs of the community and help us identify what the tolerability profile of a new therapy can be to determine if it might be acceptable to test in people with DM1. In the middle section of this slide, which is where we really are right now, PepGen in DM1, is this pivotal stage between we're working on preclinical studies as we prepare to move into the clinical space. So right now it's important for us to make sure we gather community input on draft clinical trial synopsis, so what our trial might look like, educational campaigns we're thinking about so the community can be better familiar with us and our technology and what our trial might look like, it's important for us to hear from the community, what does your treatment landscape look like and what does the patient journey look like so we can make sure we support that and we foster that in a positive way. And what are outcome measures that are important to the community so we can best align that with what we're working on. Moving into the clinical space, which is what we're looking forward to sometime next year, which we'll talk more about later, as a reminder, clinical studies are studies to test if a medicine is tolerable and effective in humans. So once we're in that space, ways that will work closely with you are to see, are there ways we can better mitigate obstacles that might arise in accessing and participating in a trial, making sure that we're meeting additional community educational needs and update as the trial starts and um, is ongoing, and then having a close eye and keeping in touch with what is the clinical trial experience people are enduring and are there any lessons from that that we can use to improve upon. And then as a conclusion for patient advocacy, really some ways that the DM1 community and PepGen can work together. At the top, I have some community activities that help us inform our own drug development. So it's hearing directly from you on days like today and other events. Patient organizations like the MDF, we're so grateful for the MDF and all the news and guidance they give us. And they also help us really understand the landscape better. Registries and surveys, information we can gather from those. Pre-competitive pre collaborations, innovations and ad boards. And then, as mentioned today, activities that we design around community insight and input are clinical endpoints, assessments, clinical protocols, therapeutic preferences of the community, 
potential preclinical targets, and educational materials creation. And now I'll hand it over to Jaya. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, MDF, for this opportunity. And thank you um, for a wonderful introduction in the beginning. So the next slide, please, to Tanya. So a little bit about myself. I graduated with a degree in biochemistry, and I have done seven years of academic research before I moved into biotechnology industry. And why it was important for me as growing up, I lost my younger sister to meningitis, which is inflammation of brain and spinal cord. That really made me dedicate my career to research and drug development, finding cures and therapies that work for neurology, neuromuscular, and rare diseases. So I have been working in the industry for more than 20 years. And prior to, bio, prior to PEPGEN, I was at Biogen, where I have been part of teams that and have led the development and launch of eight different therapeutics that are life-changing. So most rewarding part of our jobs when we are really busy day-to-day -day doing preclinical or research work, our interaction with patient communities and family members, that makes us realize how important the work is that we are doing, although far away, but it will eventually change the lives of many uh, with these diseases. So in the next slide, um, how we work with different functions to find a path for meaningful treatments. So we are at PEPGEN, as, um, um, as we pointed out, we are developing new technologies and targets that have potential to impact people living with conditions of interest, including myotonic dystrophy. We internally partner with the teams that you will meet today, clinical development, patient advocacy, we establish the unmet need of the community and we see what we can do in preclinical or research setting that enables or develops a path for potential clinical study. We also collaborate with external researchers, physicians, and key opinion leaders to think about the treatments. How does it work mechanistically? How can we design a study to make it very effective and safe so that when we go into proposed population, we have a great understanding of how this treatment works? I'll hand it back to uh, Elena or Jane. Thanks, Jaya. Hi everyone, my name is Holly and I'm a clinical operations consultant here at PEPGEN. Um, Elena, can you advance the slide? Thank you. My educational background is in cell and molecular biology and in nursing, uh, which has provided a solid foundation for the work I've immersed myself in over the past 15 years. Thus far in my career has spanned academia, CRO, pharma, and biotech with a primary focus in neurology and rare disease. PEPGEN really encompasses all of the qualities and values, which I'm so strongly drawn to. I am surrounded by brilliant people relentlessly pursuing a treatment option for those who need it most. And I consider it a privilege to be able to contribute to PEPGEN's mission. And I'm inspired by the myotonic dystrophy community in their collaborative approach to advanced research. Um, moving ahead, I want to share a little bit about my clinical operations role here at PEPGEN. And I think ClinOps can be better described as clinical trial strategy and execution. In study startup, our focus is really taking the study design and operationalizing it. So as we're developing the clinical study protocol, I'm viewing it through the lens of, are we collecting the data we need to answer the research questions being asked? But also, is this operationally feasible for our sites? And is this right for the people we're looking to recruit? Now, it takes a large and dedicated team to execute a clinical trial. And so one of the most important roles that I have is identifying and selecting the right vendors and the right clinical sites, and then making sure that those study team members have the right tools and support to succeed. But the success of a clinical trial does not just depend on the study team. It depends on our patient community. So ClinOps works closely with our patient advocacy team to develop a recruitment strategy so that we can best inform the community of the opportunity to participate in the clinical trial. And throughout the course of the study, my primary role shifts a bit to the oversight of the vendors, sites, and many cross-functional team members. 
at any given time, there are so many activities, many intertwined, often sharing dependencies, being completed by various team members. So it's critical that clinical operations keep sight of the big picture and that we're always forward looking. Success in executing a clinical trial is best achieved when we can be proactive and not just reactive. So we're thinking about the what ifs. We're putting a plan in place for those what ifs all before it actually becomes a reality. And throughout the life of a clinical project, we're thinking about what's working well, what didn't work so well, and we share those lessons learned so that we're all benefiting from the experience. So to summarize, my focus in ClinOps is really nailing down the right protocol, connecting with the patient community, identifying the right people to partner with us in executing the study, and maintaining appropriate oversight to ensure the well-being of our trial participants first and foremost, and to ensure that the data we collect is of the highest quality. Now I want to turn this over to Jane Larkindale, who will share a bit more on her role in clinical development. Thank you, Holly. And it's great, great to be here. As Tanya referred to in the introduction, I've been involved with the myotonic dystrophy community for a really long time. So it's really nice to be here on an MDF webinar and talking to all of you. So who, who am I? Um, like many of my colleagues, my, my original degrees were in molecular biology and biochemistry. Strangely enough, I started off studying plants, not humans. In fact, I did, did that all the way through my five years of postdoc, which is when I moved from New Zealand to Oxford in the UK and finally to Arizona, which is where I live now. Somehow, strangely, at that point, I took a sidestep and started working for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. This is somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago. And that's when I started really meeting the neuromuscular community. I did a lot of work in myotonic dystrophy. I met the community. And to be, to be honest, I've never left that space since. I've worked for multiple nonprofits, always in the, on the research side, trying to accelerate drug development. I've done consulting work at, in both industry and for nonprofits. And I've uh, done a fair bit of work with, with the regulators trying to smooth the pathway for new drugs. My focus has always been on accelerating drug development. It was a quite a change for me a year and a half ago when I joined PEPGEN. It was my first time actually working for industry rather than working for industry indirectly to try and accelerate drug development because I saw a platform that I really believed in and I think it can work. Uh, it, um, it has the potential to really do something meaningful for people with myotonic dystrophy and other neuromuscular diseases. So that was why I made the change into industry. It's proved to be an exciting ride. I've learned a lot. It's a wonderful, wonderful company and a wonderful group of people I work with. And I'm glad that you've had the chance to meet many of them today. Next slide, please. So I work primarily in clinical development. Michelle, who spoke earlier as the head of, head of our clinical development group. This is a, the group that works hand in hand with clinical operations to really take the data from the preclinical programs that Jaya spoke about and turn them into a plan to develop in the clinic, to go from really exciting data in animals to really exciting data, really exciting pills that can be sold, sold um, to, you, to you that really will affect the course of your disease. So that's what we do. We work with, with all the other functions in the organization to try and develop st clinical studies that will really tell us whether a drug works, if it's safe, to understand the data we get as we go along, maybe change that strategy and understand how our drugs work for people living with the diseases we're trying to treat. So we partner extensively internally. We probably partner ju just as extensively externally. You can't run a clinical trial without talking to the people you want to treat. What's important to you? If I, uh, if I cure the pain in your left little toe, will that change your life? I think the answer is probably no. But if you're trying to treat a disease, you have to talk to the community. You have to understand what's important to them. If I'm designing a trial, I have to talk to the community. I can design a, a scientifically brilliant trial that nobody will ever participate in. We still don't have a drug. So I need to be talking to you all the time. And I think that's where we really partner with Elena and our advocacy team. We really partner with groups like MDF. And we really partner with you as people living, living with myotonic dystrophy to understand what we need to do to make this, um, this work for you and what our drug needs to be to make it meaningful to you. So with that, we're going to move to the next slide. I'm going to take a step sideways and actually take you through some of the preclinical data. This is data that really comes from Jaya's team, but take you through what our enhanced delivery oligonucleotides look like in animals. Right now, our program is still at the preclinical phase. We have not tested this in human beings at this point. But as Elena um, referenced earlier, 
we're really at that transitional stage now where we can see that we want to do a clinical trial next year and we really need to therefore evaluate everything we know, everything the community can tell us and figure out how to design that perfect trial to get us forward as fast as possible. So Michelle told you some, um, quite a bit about our enhanced delivery oligonucleotides um, and at a high level what they are. This rather busy slide is a schematic of what these EDOs do, or specifically what EDO-DM1 does, which is our enhanced delivery oligonucleotide design for myotonic dystrophy type 1. So I think most of you will know that uh, myotonic dystrophy type 1 is caused by a repeat sequence, which is a particular protein, which causes the binding of another protein. That protein, muscle blind, is needed to process all kinds of other, other proteins. And that's what causes all of the many symptoms of, of myotonic dystrophy, because it's not the muscle blind itself or the DMPK where the mutation is that causes the problem. But muscle blind allows us to process um, proteins in the gut and the heart and the brain and the central urn, all parts of the body. And that's the problem, is muscle blind isn't available to do all of those different things. Our drug, PGN EDO DM1, essentially binds to that repeat sequence. It doesn't break it down, it doesn't, it doesn't make it go away, but it just binds to it. And what that means is muscle blind can't bind to it, it's blocked. So essentially we're putting in a blocker onto that repeat sequence, onto the cause of myotonic dystrophy type one, which allows the muscle blind protein to be free. It can go about all its many, many functions around, around the human body. And the goal is to restore normal, normal body functions. This is slightly different from how some of our competitors work, but that's how our drug is designed to work. And I will just step aside for a moment because I know there's always questions from the myotonic dystrophy 2 um, population. Will this work for myotonic dystrophy type 2? And unfortunately, th this particular drug, EDODM1, will not work for myotonic dystrophy type 2 simply because it's a different repeat sequence. We are interested in myotonic dystrophy type 2 and we have some investigational work ongoing. But for now, what I'm talking about is a potential therapy for DM1. Next slide, please. I don't think I need to tell you this. DM1 is a multi-systemic disorder. It doesn't just affect one thing. It may be called a muscular dystrophy, but it affects more than just skeletal muscle. I think one of the things that really drew me to our EDO platform is the fact that it delivers our um, oligonucleotides really well to lots of body systems. In the slide, you can see the respiratory system, the GI tract, that's the digestive system, the brain, the heart, the, um, both skeletal and smooth muscle, that's muscle effect affecting movement, but also muscle affecting the gut, the esophagus, all kinds of things. And we get into all of those systems really well. And we all know that these are all really important in myotonic dystrophy. I will absolutely recognize that myotonic dystrophy affects a lot of other body systems as well. We don't actually know if our peptides get oligos into those systems. We haven't tested every system in the body. This is just what we know right now. So in animal models, we're reaching almost all of the systems that we know are important for myotonic dystrophy type 1. And I think that's really exciting. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you a little bit of the data because I am a scientist and I cannot resist giving you data. Here across the x-axis, you just see a number of different systems where we have measured. Um, it's not actually PGN, EDO, DM1. It's our Duchenne compound, but because it's the delivery of the peptide should be the same. It should be the same with EDO, DM1. But you can see that basically, as you increase the dose in all of these tissues, you see increasing amounts of drug. And that's really encouraging to us. We get lots into the heart. We get lots into smooth muscle. We get lots into skeletal muscle. But perhaps most excitingly, we get some into the brain. And we uh, certainly in my previ previous life, when I've worked more on myotonic dystrophy, I've heard from the community how important some, some of those CNS symptoms are to people living with myotonic dystrophy. And I think this was probably what attracted my attention the most when I first saw this data. So this is a real summary of um, just all of the preclinical work we've done. And this is, represents an enormous amount of work that's been done by Jaya's team. We looked in patient cells. Those are cells that were that have been isolated from somebody with DM1. We have done a lot of work on a mouse model of DM1. I'll show you that in a moment. And we've done some work in both wild type mice and monkeys, but it's mostly on the safety side to understand how safe the drug could be. So this is, a, again, a fairly busy slide, but I've, we're going to start on the left. This is the work that we did in patient cells. They have a very long repeat. 
we just looked at put the drug in and looked after 24 hours. What you can see in the middle is what is called foci. This is where you where you can visualize those the clumping of the muscle blind and the pro, uh, and the protein. And it's long been hypothesized that this is this is fundamentally you're looking at the problem of myotonic dystrophy type one. So in gray, you can see untreated cells. You probably can't see the foci themselves. They're the little red dots, but hopefully you can see the tiny white arrows my colleague drew on to point, to point at them. Excitingly, if you when we treated with PGN, EDO, DM1 in the middle and teal, you can see we were down to two foci that we could see in this particular um, field. And then if we treated with the naked PMO without our delivery system, you can't really see any difference from the untreated cells. So that was really encouraging. On the right, you can see the, the, um, the, the correlation of that. We freed up the muscle blind, and you can see we corrected splicing. That means the proteins are going back to being formed the way they're supposed to be. The white bar is an untreated healthy cell. The next bar that's basically you can't see is a um, is, is cell, is cells from the myotonic dystrophy patient. And you can see with increasing doses, we got increasing correction of across a number of transcripts. Next slide. So then we went into a mouse model of myotonic dystrophy. Next slide. I'm going to go through the next slide very quickly because it just tells you a little bit about the mouse. What's important is this mouse doesn't have myotonic dystrophy, but it does have a long repeat sequence. It's expressed in a different gene, and you really only see the skeletal muscle um, part aspects of disease. So we, unfortunately, we couldn't look in the heart. We couldn't look in the brain. We were just looking at skeletal muscle in this mouse. So again, we looked at splicing, that is the formation of these proteins. In this case, we're looking at two specific proteins or transcripts. It doesn't really matter what they are. What's important is to note the black bar is wild type, and then the increasingly dark levels um, of teal are treated with our drug at increasing doses. And you can see for both transcripts we looked at, near normalization by the highest dose we checked. Perhaps most excitingly, these mice, because they have a skeletal muscle phenotype, do show myotonia. Now, I know myotonia is not the most debilitating symptom of myotonic dystrophy, but it's something that is seen in this mouse. And by 30 mg per kg dose in this mouse model, we could correct it entirely. So I think, to me, that's really exciting because that shows a phenotype. That shows something physical, a symptom of disease that at least in this model of, a model of myotonic dystrophy, we could look at, we could correct. And I'm going to show you that in a couple of videos on the next slide. Do you have to click on the first one, is Elena? So on the left, what you can see is an untreated HSA mouse, um, which hopefully, if it runs, you will see its back legs sticking out behind it because they pinch the mouse, and as they pinch the mouse, mouse's rear legs, they become myotonic, they stick out, they can't relax the muscle. But what we can see when we treat the mice, and again, you can try and click on the other one, Elena, is that the rear legs of the mouse um, are perfectly normal. There's no myotonia. What's important is you can really visualize, you can see it even in the still image on the left, that sticking out back leg that doesn't relax, whereas in a treated mouse that goes away entirely, which really encourages us about this program. Perhaps another thing that can be really, exci uh, uh, is really exciting about this is we looked at, the, at these mice over a long period, 24 weeks, so half a year, and what you can see here is in two different muscles in the leg, we see it saw this correction of splicing, that's the formation of the proteins properly, pretty quickly early, early on after a few weeks, but it was maintained over the full 24 weeks of the study. This suggests we probably are not gonna have to dose very often. We don't know what our dosing regime is yet, but it certainly won't be daily. Um, and we're really excited about how long lasting it is, which will really inform how often we need to dose and how high we need to dose. So this was really exciting data for us. Next slide, please. So just to summarize what I've told you, because I've given you a whole lot of science, and I know not, not everyone likes seeing, seeing science. I think the first conclusion is our, we're really excited about our data. And based on this data and some ongoing experiments we're doing at the moment, we're beginning to plan a clinical trial that will happen next year. And that's why we really want to talk to you and hear from you as we plan that trial. It's, it, the trial's not just based on the work I've showed you. It's based on decades of research. A lot of it was, was done at Oxford before PEPGEN was even invented. Since then, since PEPGEN um, was formed, we've done more work. We know we've delivered to the tissues that are important um, to, for, for myotonic dystrophy. Of course, that comes from preclinical models. We know that um, it affects the molecular basis of myotonic dystrophy in, in those models. And we know that we can correct myotonia in this mouse model. And we think that's a pretty powerful story as to why this might work in people. 
And with that, I'm going to hand back over to um, Elena. Oh, no, I've got one more slide before I hand back over to Elena. So where are we now? I just mentioned that this is based on decades of research. From 2018 to 2022, we did all of this work, really trying to understand what's going on in an animal model, how does this work, how safe is it, what dosing should we be looking at, all of these really important questions. And we've begun to plan for our first clinical trial. We're having a community advisory board next week to start informing, informing us on our, our synopsis. We're talking to the community. We're excited to come to the MDF um, meeting in, um, in is it next month or the month after to meet you all and talk to you more. This is a very exciting time for us. Next year, we hope to initiate our first clinical trial, and the following year, we'll have data to share with you in myotonic dystrophy patients. And that's a really exciting plan for us. With that, I will hand back to Elena, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jane, and thanks, everyone. So really, to wrap up, we want to thank you again for your time today, and not just today, but everything so far that the DM1 community has taught us and worked with us and the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation for hosting us today and, and allowing us to have this space. We'll be here for Q&A. I do also want to remind the community that you can email us at community at pepgen.com. That's a mailbox that is monitored by all of us and we'll make sure your question or inquiry is um, responded to by the appropriate person at PepGen. So we're gonna move on to q and I'm gonna stop sharing and once I stop sharing, I will ask all my team members to come back online and um, be ready for their questions. So for everyone, great. So I'm gonna start off first with some questions that we received in advance. And thank you so much for all of you that did that. We really appreciate it. My first question is for Michelle. The question is, will the drug cure DM1? Will it impact symptoms, reverse progress, stop progression? Please be specific. So thank you all for that um, question. And I would like to say that um, our, um, apologies, um, our PGN uh, DM1 uh, is designed uh, to target the root cause of disease and basically to modify disease progression. Um, and we will assess the impact uh, or its capability to reverse progress or stop progression um, based on our clinical trials that we have designed. However, based on our preclinical data, we anticipate that we will have an effect on multiple systems. And what we need is for that you as the community help us to identify um, what symptoms have had the most significant impact on your daily function, and we will design our clinical trials around that to be sure that we are designing clinical trials uh, that are meaningful uh, for uh, the DM1 community or the DM community as a whole. Thanks, Michelle. And I have another question for you, and the question is, what type of side effects will we experience if we take your drug? So uh, our clinical trials uh, will include um, those doses that have been identified as that as, as have been identified as best tolerated in uh, preclinical studies. We will continue uh, to modify or monitor for the side effects um, in our clinical trials, and um, we will incorporate again those uh, doses um, that are best tolerated in our clinical studies. Great, thank you. And my next question is for Jaya. Jaya, how is our approach or drug different than others out there? Thank you for that question. Um, as we know, there is definitely right now no cure for DM1. Most of the therapies out there are treating the symptoms. There are a couple of approaches that are being tried now in preclinical setting and entering clinic. So currently, a couple of approaches that I can talk about, one is that is reducing or eliminating the disease causing toxic DMPK RNA as Jane showed you. So that is really eliminating the entire DMPK RNA or the protein related to it. Our approach with our EDO DM1 molecule is just blocking 
the RNA binding proteins as Jane talked about, muscle blind like one. So we will restore the functionality as we showed with our data. In addition, as we, as the field, I think the most challenging aspect in drug development have been delivery of the therapeutic to organs or tissues that are really critical or important. And Jane went through the data. We are very excited that we get meaningful levels of drug that we have measured in the tissues or organs that really matter in DM1, including the CNS. So this data is very exciting and it's different from any other approach out there. And that is critical to get this disease to the organs which are involved. Thanks, Jaya. My next question is for Holly. Holly, we got a lot of questions around inclusion, exclusion criteria of the study. So I'm gonna sum that up for you. Um, when we start the trial, can you speak to what the inclusion exclusion criteria will be? We got some questions around pacemakers. We got some questions around people that can't walk. Can you um, share anything about the inclusion exclusion criteria so far? Sure. So we are actively developing a clinical study protocol and that's inclusive of defining that eligibility criteria. And a critical part of that process includes engaging our scientific experts, clinicians, advocacy groups, and the DM community to provide their feedback on our proposed study design. So we wanna make sure that it's not just feasible for our sites, but that it's appropriate and meaningful for people living with DM1. So unfortunately, I can't speak to specific eligibility criteria at this time, but I'm hopeful that, that next year we'll be able to share some more with you. Thanks, Holly. And Holly, also for you, we got a lot of questions about location of site. So can you speak to where the location of our clinical trial sites may be? Sure. So we have not yet completed our country or site selection, but as our timelines develop, I really encourage everyone to keep visiting the MBF website, clinicaltrials.gov, and other organizations to remain up to date. Thanks, Holly. And the other question we got, I'm going to pose this to Michelle as um, our, our MD on staff. Michelle, can you share any recommendations for a balanced treatment regimen of medicine, if applicable, such as physical therapy, cognitive exercises, and supplements? So I would like to reiterate that there are no medications or no treatments right now that target the underlying cause of disease in myotonic dystrophy. And currently what we're focused on here at PepGen is developing a therapy uh, that targets the underlying cause and uh, results in disease uh, modification uh, uh, for um, DM1. Uh, in terms of current therapies that are available, most of these therapies are supportive therapies, and you should talk with your treating physician as everybody's needs are different. And even uh, when I'm talking to patients uh, in my clinic, uh, each of those treatments are even individualized to what their needs are. So I encourage you to uh, talk with your uh, physician um, about what best treatments are for you. Those supportive treatments uh, can include anything along the lines of treatments for um, myotonia or um, for um, uh, your a, a, a pacer um, if you have a cardiac arrhythmia. Um, so please talk with your physician for the best treatment for you. Thanks, Michelle. And another question for you that we got is, what approach will we be using? Will it be pills, liquid, IV? And how often will people need to take the drug? So currently, uh, it is an IV formulation. It will be given uh, intravenously. And based on our preclinical data, as well as the clinical data, we will be able to assess uh, the best uh, treatment uh, and dosing paradigm. Great. Thank you. And the last question we have um, that we received in advance, Jane touched on this a little bit, but just to reiterate it, and I'm going to pass this to Jaya, is are we planning a trial, Jaya, for DM2, and if not, why? Thank you for that question. Uh, I really want to thank the community because all the research that we do and share is 
dependent on the tools that have been developed prior to us. So as Jane showed you the data for DM1, we have patient cell lines that show us a phenotype and we can test a molecule that shows benefit. And as we have in DM1, cellular models and animal models that we showed you the data, uh, unfortunately for DM2, we do not have very well characterized patient derived cell lines, which have been well characterized or animal models that show similar behavioral or molecular phenotype. So if these tools are there, we can definitely expedite some of the preclinical or discovery work that we do. So we are definitely engaging with academic collaborators, our patient communities, and clinical sites as well, just to think about what tools can we use to expedite this development in DM2. So we are definitely looking at DM2 as a target and looking at these tools to expedite our research work to drive that into clinic. Thank you, Jaya. And so far I see live, we received um, one question and I'm also gonna give this to Jaya. The question is, the EDO platform for DM1 sounds extremely promising. Has PepGen considered appending a small handle onto an EDO to recruit ribonucleases to degrade the toxic CUG repeats? Yeah, thank you. So as I talked about, there are two different approaches we can take. One is degrading or targeting the CUG repeats for degradation. But if you think about there are a number of proteins or transcripts that have CUG repeats or CAG repeats. So approach we took, and there are some proteins that have function. So if you degrade it completely, we are degrading some uh, proteins that that will that have normal function in our approach we are just trying as Jane showed to block the binding of RNA binding proteins to the toxic repeats so that we are maintaining the functionality of the wild type protein as well as restoring the functionality because of this toxic repeat so we definitely feel the approach we are taking is superior to an approach that will degrade the proteins that have CUG repeats or transcript that have CUG repeats. Great. Thank you. And then I'm just double checking. I, um, I'm going to actually ask to um, Tanya and Cleed. I know we're out of time right now. I think it's best that we might wrap up. Sure, that's no problem at all. That's, thank you, Elena, Michelle, Jane, Jaya, Holly. Uh, we're grateful for your focus on DM1, especially for your position and belief that your success is really dependent upon learning directly from the DM community. Um, I wanna thank you for sharing your progress and it's exciting that you're close to launching a clinical trial. Um, we're, we're very hopeful. I'd like to thank everybody here on the webinar today for being here and for to the Peptin team for sharing the exciting data and the approach itself. Um, for those of you still with us today, Peptin is a sponsor of the MDF conference. As they mentioned, they will be in San Diego to talk with us directly and answer questions in person. So um, thank you everyone and we wish you a fantastic weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.